rolling into our program proper here. And before we introduce our wonderful speaker, and man, we got a good one lined up today. I was excited about this one. When I saw we were doing this, this particular topic with this particular speaker, I was really happy to learn that I was going to be present for this conversation because this is a good one. We got lined up. More on that in a second. If you are not already a member of HSGP, you can come to hsgp.org. You can head on over and sign up for a membership. I signed up for HSGP and look how I turned out. Yeah, it's going pretty well for me, right? Um, also, you can find us on Patreon. You can find us on Meetup, like I was telling you earlier, uh, where you can find events like this and everything else that we do. Um, and we are on YouTube. So to those of you watching on YouTube, thank you for joining us on YouTube. Make sure you uh, leave a like, drop a comment to be part of the conversation. And like I said, head on over hsgp.org and sign up and, and come have some fun with us. Uh, here in person or or through YouTube or whatever means you can. We also do a lot of Zoom events too, by the way. So even if you're not nearby, if you're somebody that lives off in the distance, but you still want to be part of what we're doing, hey, check us out on Meetup, all kinds of fun stuff going on. So at that point, let's go ahead and get into our uh, program proper and introducing our uh, our speaker, Stephanie Kemmerer. I say that right, Stephanie? Yes, you did. Oh, look at me go. Stephanie Kemmerer. All right. Stephanie Kemmerer is a uh, a a former Sandy Hook and 9-11 truther, as in somebody who used to, to buy into those conspiracy theories and uh, participate in those discussions, right? We've all we've all heard about these kinds of things. We've all heard about these conspiracy theories, and most of us just kind of brush them off uh, because we don't, if you don't necessarily buy into it. But the cool thing about this discussion is we're going to get a look at some of this material from a way that I've certainly never seen it because I've never seen it from the other side. I've never heard what it's like to be uh, in the camp that buys into this sort of thing. So not only was Stephanie somebody who bought into this sort of thing, but Stephanie was somebody who found uh, found this found the way out of this sort of thing to uh, to and now is helping others. Right. Uh, Stephanie yep. formed. Hang on. I want to make sure I get this one right, too. I don't usually like to refer to my notes, but I don't, also don't want to get anything wrong. Right. So uh, Stephanie's part of the Alliance Information and in, I'm sorry, American in, Information Integrity Alliance. That's why we got the notes. Um, and actually formed a, a subgroup within within that organization, D-O-U-B-T, Doubt, Discussing Our Unusual Beliefs Together. It's a support system for people who are trying to get past their belief in uh, conspiracy theories and kind of reintegrate themselves into, into the more mainstream uh, thought that, that, that many of us share, if indeed there is such a thing as mainstream thought, I suppose. Um, I guess at this point, uh, let's just go ahead and give a big HSGP welcome to Stephanie Kemmer. Hello. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, uh, I'll just kind of give you guys like a little brief rundown. Basically, what, what I want to show everyone is that one of the elements that gets people into conspiracy theories, I think, is also an element that can bring people out. And that element is the phrase they're lying to you and for me getting out of the rabbit hole and some stuff i'm just still recently discovering today and the realization that you've been lied to is a very impactful one it's a very strong sense of abuse you feel really really bad but when you see that these lies are purposeful and you've been, the truth has been hidden from you by people who claim to want to expose the truth, that is a very painful thing to come to grips with, to see how badly you've been lied to by people who claim to want to show you the truth. That's, that's a very strange phenomena and that was very weird for me and that's I want to kind of show you some of the ways in which conspiracy theories and theorists lie to people in the name of truth um just what just let me know when you want me to start with the slide I I think uh, I think you're ready to go um Kat let's Oh, okay. Go ahead and share your screen and then we'll be able to see what, uh, what you got going there. And by the way, everybody, if you do have questions for our presenter, um, just kind of keep a note of them. And at the conclusion of the presentation, we will go around the room and um, uh, be able to field a few questions, hopefully to our presenter um, within, you know, whatever our time is allowing for. Give me one second. I just need to scroll to the beginning. 
Okay, okay. Yeah. We can, we, we can, we can see it up here, uh, up here now. Okay. All right. So, uh, and pardon me, I'm going to have to read off of handwritten notes. So if you see me looking down, sorry about that. Um, Okay, so what conspiracy theories steal from us? Uh, that they, they control the narrative and destroy the truth. And on the left, you're gonna see an image that the conspiracy theorists like to show you of World Trade Center 7. They will show you this side of the building exclusively when they show you it fall, when they show the collapse. And they'll say, how did this undamaged building collapse? It must be controlled demolition, but the other image is the side that they don't want you to see. This is the heavily damaged portion of the building. And when I was coming out of the rabbit hole and I finally saw this side of the building, I became so white hot angry. And, but that this, this is just one example of many of how they will lie to you and how truth is being hidden from you by conspiracy theories. And um, this isn't just a story of what conspiracy theories stole from me personally. This is a story of what they steal from us collectively because these doubts that they plant in our minds work their way into our collective consciousness and they are damaging, they can, clearly ruin people's lives and they can destroy your brain. And uh, I just also wanted to point out that the author of the Nobody Died at Sandy Hook book, Jim Fetzer, um, he was sued in court by the Sandy Hook families. I believe they got him for $450,000, which really isn't enough in my opinion. But Jim Fetzer was also one of the big names in the 9-11 truth movement. And uh, the importance with conspiracy theories is controlling the narrative. And controlling the narrative is something that you see with cult leaders. You see it with toxic, abusive relationship partners. You see it with conspiracy theorists. You see it with serial killers. Their whole purpose is to alter the reality that we all share and know. In the course of everyday events, we have this shared reality and it's based on a shared and agreed narrative structure. And what they want to do is to alter this, to change it, to make it fit their own motives. And this is one of the things that can make you go against your own best wishes, your own logic, your own reasoning. If you are exposed to this alternate narrative enough times, you can come to eventually believe the lies that you are being fed. And one example of controlling the narrative we saw in the aftermath of the Uvalde shooting, the police were trying to do it as well as the conspiracy theorists. They Police were trying to min minimize and excuse away their absolute cowardice in the face of danger. They waited in the halls while children died, supposedly waiting for someone to unlock a door. And also conspiracy theorists stepped in to declare that it was a false flag, literally the moment it happened. And we saw this again with the Allen Texas mall shooter where he was a Hispanic male who had a swastika tattoo. And if you're familiar with tattoos in this photo, you can see the raised image of the SS logo. That was a new tattoo. You don't see that with old tattoos. So this was a brand spanking new tattoo when this picture was taken and people were losing their minds. How could a Hispanic male be a Nazi? Well, have you heard of Nick Fuentes? But whenever something is inconvenient to their narrative, they will seek to alter and change and revise it. It's, it's a revisionist history that is unfolding as it happens. 
And this is because they need to change that narrative to fit what they want. We, we also saw it with the Buffalo Shooters Manifesto, um, some of which I had actually read. Very disturbing, very horrific white supremacy, great replacement stuff. This went against the narrative of many of the people who fall in line with these beliefs. They didn't want their hero to be seen as their hero. So they had to try to get a hold of anything the minute it comes out. And that is one of the most important things. You have to inject your narrative. You have to control your narrative the second an event happens. You have to get your hands in the cement while it's still wet. This is something that you see with many different conspiracy influencers, especially Alex Jones. You see this time and time again. The minute something happens, it's already a false flag or it's already this or it's already that. And that's because you have to get your print in there before the cement dries. And um, sorry, I just have to, okay, sorry. Um, once they're able to inject their own version of events through several different techniques, they now have a competing version of the truth. Even if people don't believe in this false version of events at first, with enough repeated exposure, they might begin to question what really happened. And many conspiracy theorists couch their arguments as just asking questions. And like it says here, there's nothing wrong with asking questions, but you have to be willing to accept the answer to those questions. And conspiracy theorists almost never do. And the uh, stereotypical response you get when confronting a conspiracy theorist about their claims, this is the way that they brush off all attempts at debunking. For some, this is a method of protecting their own dogmatic beliefs. They have nothing to really lose but their investment in these beliefs. But for others, especially influencers, podcasters, bloggers, the need to control the narrative is really overwhelming because they may not be true believers, but this is how they're making their money. So they have to keep you convinced of their narrative in order to keep making that money. And essentially conspiracy theories are stories. That's what they are. They are stories that we pass down. They're stories passed down through hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years. And the problem isn't that they're stories. The problem is that they're stories that are seen as truth. And by the time you get to the end of the story that rainbow in the picture is woke, the trees are GMO, the river is polluted by chemicals that turn the frogs gay. But in reality, the house is in foreclosure because the sovereign citizen who owns it refuses to pay their taxes. So it is a story, but it's one that can have real and damaging consequences for those who believe it. And it can also alter our shared reality. Now, my, my big thing, I've been in and out of conspiracy theories all my life, you know, Bigfoot, Spring Heel Jack, all that fun stuff. And it's fun at first. And then you start to believe, and then it's not as much fun. But one of my big entries into the hardcore conspiracy world was 9-11. And again, they're right here, World Trade Center, World Trade Building 7, that doesn't even make sense, their wording. WTC 7, didn't just blow itself up. Well, it didn't blow itself up at all. And one of the things, and I had just recently discovered this, there is an audio and a video clip that you will find time and time again in the truth or community. You hear a firefighter saying, keep your eyes on that building, it's coming down. I had never heard the full clip or seen the full video before until recently. And the thing that the conspiracy theorists don't want you to know, they don't want you to know the full 
audio of that, full audio of that, you can hear a loud, audible crack. And then you hear one firefighter say, what was that? And then you hear the other firefighters say, keep your eyes on that building, it's coming down. The crack and the other firefighter asking, what was that? That ruins their narrative. So they only play the firefighter that says, keep your eyes on that building, it's coming down. And that they use as a claim to tell you that it's controlled demolition. Now, I had long since stopped believing in controlled demolition, but when I first heard this entire clip, my eyes nearly popped out of my head because I really felt angry. Like they cherry picked that clip and they deceptively odd, um, edited the clip just so you would hear this one phrase from the firefighter as if he knew that there was controlled demolition. But there wasn't, you can hear the crack, you can hear the structural damage on the audio tape. And that is just one of the many ways in which they will deceive you. Another thing that they do, they won't show you these images. They won't show you anybody looking at this image. You don't need to be an engineer. You don't need to be an architect. You don't need to be a firefighter. You look at this image of the North Tower, that's coming down. I can tell you that not because I know the history of it, but look at that. There's leaning, there's bulging. You can see the catastrophic widespread structural damage and you don't need to be an expert to do that. They won't show you these images. They don't want you to see this because it ruins their narrative. And another thing that I did not, I might get a little choked up at this part. Um, so I apologize. This is my favorite story from 9-11 and I did not learn it until the 20th anniversary. Stanley Pramuth was, um, he's the gentleman on the left. He worked on the 81st floor of the South Tower. Brian Clark, the other gentleman with the glowing blue eyes, he worked on the 84th floor of the South Tower. Two didn't know each other. Stanley made it all the way down to the bottom of the building shortly after the North Tower was struck. He decided to go back up. He was at his desk and he saw a fast moving object approaching him. It was the plane. He dove under his desk and yelled, God, you take over. I don't know what to do. Which is kind of adorable in that moment. And I pretty sure I would probably say the same thing. And I'm not religious. Um, meanwhile, Brian was making his way down from the 84th floor with a man named Ron DeFrancesco. They, were, they encountered a group on the stairs who said, you can't go down, it's too smoky. We're going up. Ron joined them and made it all the way up to the 91st floor where he said people were passing out. And in fact, he himself lost consciousness a few times. Ron was smart enough to continue and go down instead of up. Ron survived that day, the others did not. Brian, meanwhile, was stuck on the 81st floor because he heard a voice crying for help. Stanley was trapped behind a wall of rubble. Brian and Stanley worked to get Stanley free. Stanley ended up getting free and he fell on top of Brian, and gave him a big kiss on the cheek. The two men had cuts on the palms of their hands. And they said, from this day forth, we're brothers. And they held their hands together. They both survived and they are both friends to this day, sorry. <laughs> but this was a story that was stolen from me by the truthers. And I can't imagine a more perfect story. Another thing that um, conspiracy theories do is victims are numbers. When you look at the 9-11 truth movement, you will hear, well, some of them, the ones who believe that people actually did die that day, you will hear them talk about nearly 3,000 victims who lost their lives. 
I would challenge any of these truthers to give me a name, an age, or a location where the remains were found or where they died. And they can't because the victims are just numbers to them. This is Christine Hansen. She was the youngest victim of 9-11. She was two and a half years old and she was aboard United Airlines Flight 175, which hit the south side of the South Tower at 9.03 a.m. She died alongside of her parents, Peter and Sue Kim. Such a short, tiny little existence that she lived. And her Peter Rabbit stuffed animal <clears throat> is on display at the 9-11 Memorial Museum. You won't hear the truthers mention her because she doesn't fit their narrative. She was an adorable little girl who had a Grateful Dead dancing bear shirt. She liked Mickey Mouse. She doesn't further their cause and they won't talk about her. And now we get to the dark stuff. And I just wanna say that while I did buy into the Sandy Hook false flag theories, I did not buy into Simon Shack's Fixum's theories. Simon is also a no planer, which I did eventually buy into, but I never once doubted <clears throat> that the victims were anything but real human beings. Simon's idea that these were all CGI, that the people who fell from the building that day were CGI that the bodies that you did see at the base of the building, barely recognizable, that those were all pixels. And to me, this, if, if this, if you wanna believe this, okay, you know, cause like I said, I, I had some similar thoughts about Sandy Hook, but I was never cruel or loud about it. Simon shows videos of the fallers with little arrows showing their descent and then leave some kind of mocking comment on that video and it's really really disturbing to me and very upsetting um and i think simon is a very evil man and one of the things and in, i'm using this image as a placeholder because even though i'm familiar with the fallers I understand that the images can be upsetting to a lot of people. And I'm using this image because it does, it, it bears a striking resemblance to the famous image of the fallen man. And in fact, um, Simon likes to say that because the falling man, uh, his descent looked so similar to the tarot card that it's proof of some kind of conspiracy. Um, in reality, they were rigid, they were originally called jumpers and discussions have since come down to jumping implies a thoughtful act. It implies that you're making a choice. They didn't jump, they fell, they had no choice. And um, they were in a situation that to this day, people still have a hard time discussing the fallers. And I apologize if I'm upsetting anyone, but I want to make a point to everyone that these are the people who I personally revere more than any other victims that day, because these were the people who were in the unthinkable situation. This was the situation that no one can ever imagine themselves being in. And the fact that Simon and other people call them CGI, is just destructive, more than destructive. And I also wanted to let everybody know, an interesting fact is that there were only 19 of the people who died on September 11th, whose deaths were listed as anything other than homicide. The bodies that were recovered of the fallers, all the bodies, buildings, planes, the Pentagon, and the field in Shanksville, Shanksville 
the cause of death was homicide, except for the 19 hijackers. They didn't jump, they fell. And to deny that they existed, denied the courage and the bravery of their last moments. And even when I was a truth, I had a personal experience that trumped conspiracy theories. This is Colleen Sapinski. She grew up and lived in the Eastern Pennsylvania area. She moved to New York City and she got a job with, sorry, Sandler O'Neill. And they had offices on the 104th floor of the South Tower. From 1999 to 2004, I had worked at a newspaper in Easton that was called the Express Times. And I was in the newsroom and I did some assistant work. One of my jobs was to assist with obituaries. I wrote Colleen's obituary. And I knew from personal experience when I came across Simon's fix him theory that no one died on 9-11. I said, no, this isn't true. I wrote her obit. Now a conspiracy theorist will tell you, well, that's fake. No, working as obituaries, when someone dies, they're issued a death certificate. In absence of a body, you can you know, go before a judge in a court to have that person declared legally dead. This happened, I think, um, maybe five to 10 years ago with Natalie Holloway. If there's good reason to believe that someone has died, then a death certificate will be issued. And then that death certificate, the family gets a copy. The funeral director gets a copy. Then the funeral director who is a, who's licensed in their state and nationwide to do the work that they do, writes up an obituary and sends it to the newspaper. There is a chain of custody from the issuance of a death certificate to the writing of an obituary. Colleen existed. She lived and she died. Therefore, every other human being who died on 9-11 was a real human being. And I know this from my own personal experience. So even when I was a truther, I was pushing back against the no one died on 9-11 theory. This is something that people don't think about in the conspiracy world, is that this isn't just a CGI image. This person has, her family has memories. Her coach has memories. You can find articles of her high school coach talking about her. These are things that can't be faked. And then he said, Jesse Lewis was only six when he died at Sandy Hook Elementary School on <clears throat> December 14th, 2012 in Newtown, Connecticut. At one point, the shooter's gun had jammed. Jesse took that moment and yelled from about nine of his classmates, about the same age as he was, they ran. Those kids are in college now. Jesse died that day. These are the things the conspiracy theorists don't want you to know. They don't want you to know what this little boy did, that he saved lives. Some will say cynically, how would a six-year-old boy know? A six-year-old knows danger. He said, run. Some of his classmates lived, and he did not. And I do want to say that one of the most satisfying moments of my life was watching his mother confront Alex Jones in court. She said, you look me in the eye, Alex. My boy lived. And like I said, I used my own experience with Colleen to push back against the 9-11 victim the theory, but somehow that logic was absent when it came to Sandy Hook. But Jesse's story was stolen from me. Jesse's last moments were stolen from all of us. 
because of conspiracy theories. If you say this little boy didn't live, then how are the, the, those nine kids that are in college now, which is where Jesse should be? And when people buy into these beliefs, you're selling your sanity. You are giving up all that's good of you as a person. You're giving up your trust in humanity. You are given into a dark nihilistic cynicism. When you take the red pill, you're also taking the black pill. And when you're in this state, unconnected events suddenly seem connected. You, are, you become convinced people are spying on you or looking in on you. None of these things are real. Anger and rage become your permanent state. And then this is how you live when you buy into their narratives. And once you are willing to accept the idea that something is a false flag, you've kind of crossed the line. This is often the point of no return for many people. And it could have been the point of no return for me, but there are some who come back. This is Gary, Jatarth, and Brent. And Gary's here with us today, if anyone wants to say hello and thank you. These are three of my friends. They were all false flaggers and they all came back just like I did. Um, Gary is smiling and doing better in his life. He's so much happier now. Chatarth has been on CNN several times, one time famously apologizing to Anderson Cooper for thinking Anderson once ate babies. Um, look that up, it's pretty funny. And Brent has become big. He's been doing a lot with the BBC lately. And these are three other people. I'm not the only one. And there are even more out there. And why it's important to examine what conspiracy theories steal from us. Because we need to understand that in the search for truth, sometimes it's the ones who couch, who wrap themselves in the cloak of truth that are the biggest liars. And you need to know that with all the information that's out there, it's important that we get our sources from, well, we get our information from reliable sources, but it's important that we also understand when a conspiracy theorist opens their mouth, whether they know it or not, they're lying. They may not know that they're lying or they might know that they're lying. That's what they're doing. And one of the favorite phrases of conspiracy theories is que bono, who benefits? And they like to ask this question. And then the answer to that question is usually the big bad guy behind their conspiracy theory. And spoiler alert, if you dig deep enough, the answer is almost always the Jewish people for some reason, makes you wonder. We should ask this question when we're confronted with a conspiracy theory. Who benefits from you believing in this conspiracy theory? The conspiracy theorists do, usually the influencers, usually the Ben Shapiros and the Nick Fuentes and the Alex Jones and the David Ikes and the Jim Fetzers. They're the ones who benefit. And I think it's important that we take it back from them. We have to take back the narrative. We have to reclaim the actual, the really real truth. They stole the truth from us. They stole these stories from us. And they steal it from even people who don't believe in the conspiracy theories. They steal it from all of us. And we have to take it back from them we have to reclaim reality. 
And I like to tell people this a lot of, uh, I, this is one of my favorite things about my past with conspiracy theories, dabbled in and out all my life. There used to be something so fun about having to dig, about having to look, about having to find and seek out the conspiracy theories. Now, the minute that elevator door opens, they are, boom, ready for you. And then once you get bitten by them, you go on to spread that disinformation to other people. It used to be fun to seek these things out. Now they're seeking you out. And it's not as much fun anymore. And this is just a little joke I threw in there. And thanks to my friend Chris for sending me the, the meme. Um, but it's true. How do you find out if someone is a conspiracy theorist? You do nothing. They'll tell you without you having to ask. But what about former conspiracy theorists? That takes a lot more digging. And one of the ways we can reclaim the truth is to speak out, speak up, and speak often. And this was a shirt that a friend of mine from Twitter had made for me. And I wear this very proudly. Whenever I get to go out, I wear this shirt. And I love it. And I'm proud of it. And we need to speak out. Even if you were like someone who just saw JFK the movie and you were like yeah you know I kind of believe this stuff and then you were kind of in it for a little bit speak up tell someone talk to them about it and let people know yeah I used to believe some crazy stuff but eh, you know I don't anymore the more that we can normalize this former bad belief system the easier it'll be for other people to join us and um that's really what we want. We want people to speak up. And, you know, even if it's, like I said, if it's something very simple, like, well, you know, I wasn't getting a flu shot for a while because I kind of thought, hmm, tell your story. And also share your connection to tragedies. I know someone who was at the Mandalay Hotel the day of the shooting. I have friends who have friends who are at Pulse. I, I, I have a friend who worked with a Sandy Hook parent. Share these connections to tragedies, even if they're tangential, because those are things that can't be faked. By speaking out about our former beliefs and by sharing our connections to tragedies, we're creating a narrative of reality that makes it harder and harder for conspiracy theorists to push their narrative against. And um, I just wanted to give some recommendations. Uh, these are podcasts, Q-Dropped, QAnon Anonymous, Behind the Bastards, Knowledge Fight, Did Nothing Wrong, My Buddy Poker, His Adventures in Hell World, uh, Conspiracy Clearinghouse, Historical Blindness, Conspirituality, and Brent's podcast, some dare, dare call it conspiracy. And then some films. And the one in the middle is a film by Alex Winter and Gail Ann Hurd from, you may know her from The Walking Dead and Aliens. Um, the film has just recently come out. I haven't gotten to see it yet. Saw the trailer. It looks amazing. And uh, book recommendations, Jewish Space Lasers, Trust the Plan, and the Storm is Upon Us. Jewish Space Lasers will be out in September. I have my advanced copy, which the cat has completely destroyed because she loves it for some reason. And for uh, further information on 9-11 and Sandy Hook, for those who might be interested in digging in, I highly recommend these three books. I find myself returning to 102 minutes almost every day. I've probably read it like five times now. And uh, for streaming, uh, Echoplex Media, I'm an occasional guest on there. Um, there's the, the Twitch address, and we basically do Mystery Science Theory 3000 with conspiracy theory videos. 
So that is a, a fun thing to do. And I actually get to learn a lot of new stuff. And then a uh, special thanks to Dapper Gander, Karma, Mike Rothschild, Poker and Politics, Quacks Anonymous, Sarah Ariano, Sarah Hightower, Seth Dare, Cheyenne, I can't say his last name, I'm sorry, Travis View, Will Summer, and all of the other researchers without their work, I could not do mine. And I also wanted to give a special thanks to Arizona Right Wing Watch for showing up and for being awesome. And if you would like to get in contact with the American Information Integrity Alliance, our website is just starting out. It's new. And you can reach out to me at doubt is the way out at Proton Mail as well. Um, and I apologize for getting a little choked up throughout the presentation. I kind of had a feeling it was going to happen. But thank you for taking this journey with me and for letting me show you all of the wonderful stories that get stolen from us. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was a, that, that was an, that was an amazingly well presented and, and rather, rather moving presentation. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, we're going to open it up to questions. I, I know we got some in here because I got about a million but I'm going to I'm going to hold off and see if anyone else asks the stuff I'm thinking about. Um, so, uh, Stephanie, if you'll stay with us just a moment, we got our first question coming to you. Here. This isn't a question. It's a 9-11 story. I have a stepdaughter who used to work at the Trade Center. I tried to get a hold of her all day that day. We woke up to the uh, plane hitting a building on TV in. Into one of the towers. I tried all day to get a hold of Teresa. We finally, I think, contact connected with her the next day later. Unbeknownst to us, she was no longer work, sorry, working at the Trade Center. Thank the gods for that. But she, you know, when we finally got to talk to her, she said she could see that she was moving, she had moved further away in still in New York City. She was able to see the smoke from her office building. It took her all day to get home. She took taxis, she thumbed rides, she walked. Believe yeah. me, people, believe me, people, this was fucking real. It was. Yeah, thank you. All right, so... Um... Got another another comment or a question over here. And by the way, if you guys have similar stories or uh, things you want to share, your own personal experience, maybe there's one of these uh, theories that you once subscribed to, and you want to, you know, briefly tell us what it was and how you found your way out. It'd be an okay time to share that too. All right. Well, thank you for for telling me about Teresa and and share that story often and always fight back against the people who say it wasn't real or that the government did it. Always fight back. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Another question or comment here. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for the presentation, it, but uh, I'm, I have a quibble and uh, it, it's with the phrase things they don't want you to know, which, uh, and I think you kind of alluded to this. The, the reason I'm not a fan of that is it sounds like they no, but don't, but are lying. And I'm kind of wondering, do the conspiracists, and I don't want to name any names about somebody who might say he knows the election was stolen and denies it, but do the conspiracists really, and you kind of alluded to this, are they lying when they withhold part of the evidence or are they simply deluding themselves? I think it's it, there's there's always like a delineation like you you have your true believers and you know kind of that would have been me the true believer and you also have the you know the propagandists like you look at Dylan Avery and Loose Change those are the people who are lying and you and you you can kind of tell especially with Loose Change because they kept updating and you know deleting stuff or or adding stuff so there is there there is a some a faction that really does believe, and those are usually the consumers. And then you have 
some of them who are in it for the money and some of them may know that they're lying some of them may just be so deluded that they think that they're not lying it's it's kind of hard to delineate but i i i think the best way to look at it is just assume they're lying in a way they are even if they don't know it you know what i mean all right got another question or comment right here yes i want to thank you and i appreciate the emotional you know pain that you will be willing to expose to us here uh, i really uh, uh, acknowledge and, and respect that um yeah some of this stuff you know where the people falling off the buildings or you know cgi that's just stone evil i, I i'm with you on that you know and i appreciate also that you pointed out at one point that where the police were trying to hide their cowardice by not you know, addressing a, a terrible tragedy that was going on in front of them. Because I, I think it's really important that once we realize that so many of these stories that are being presented to us are fake and are done for the aggrandizement of the conspiracy theorists, uh, I think it's important for us to to keep a perspective that not everything that the you know the official site you know, if, if it, not 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 all the time the official story isn't always true either so we have to keep a balance of yeah some of these conspiracy theories are just batshit you know crazy and evil and and harming people and at the same time sometimes the official story ain't true either so it's important to keep that balance yeah look look at the 911 commission like they they one of the things that they struggled with was so many of the people we interviewed were lying to us. And that doesn't mean that the government did 9-11. It just means, you know, they're trying to cover their own ass. <laughs> All right. And got another question or comment here. I thank you for your presentation. I have two things, actually. One of them is uh, from personal experience. It's not always on a huge scale, like what you're talking about. It can also be just in individual lives and families that things are told and things are, and people lie. Like if, as an example, I'm adopted and I was never told. And it wasn't until my dad died when I was 19 that, um, that I found out that I was adopted and it felt like my whole life was a lie. Like in literally like all the family talked about it behind my back, but like people in the street, my teachers, everybody knew except for me. And so it was like, my whole life had been this lie. And I was, and it was like, I was the butt of a joke, my, my, you know, up until then. So just, I guess a general statement of realize that it doesn't have to be on a huge scale like that. Sometimes it can be smaller, but, um, my my question though is so I have a coworker. We mostly work remote, and there's a few of us that are local here. And so a couple of weeks ago, um, three of us had gotten together for lunch. Well, one of them, she clearly has gone down the rabbit hole since the pandemic, and um, and so it was a very uncomfortable um, lunch to say the least of us, the other lady and I, trying to be reasonable but not offensive. What's the, what do you suggest for things like that? It was clear there was no amount of us saying like, that doesn't make any sense that she was gonna listen to. It, it's, it's, it's difficult. I kind of came up with like a little like chart for our organization. I, I call it the mental calculus. Like how much contact do you have with the person? How, how often are you around them? Like how close is your relationship? You got to kind of weigh that out. Like, is it worth the time and effort that you would have to put in? You know, I, I suggest to a lot of people, if you can find like a neutral topic, like, and, and if it's someone that you're close to and you hang out with, I always tell people use South Park because South Park is so anti-left and anti-right and you can both laugh at each other but if it's if it's co-worker I, I think sometimes with that it's not you don't attack the conspiracy theory you know you don't really it's not necessarily about debunking the conspiracy theory what's going on in your life let's not talk about conspiracy theories tell me what's going on in your life and you're probably going to find that some and, and I mean a lot of people got sucked into it with the pandemic because it was such a traumatic event and that's what draws people into this but there's something also underneath that's going on in her life and if you can kind of get to that and maybe work on that 
sometimes then the conspiracy theories will fall kind of by the wayside. All right. It's, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because there's, there's no universal, you know, there's no universal fix because everyone's kind of different, but sometimes if you can find the underlying issue that will help. I have another question or comment here for you. Hi, thank you for a great presentation, Stephanie. Um, this is going to be more of a comment. And one of the things that we're talking about is free speech and how messy it can be. There's going to be a lot of conversations out there, and some of them we agree with, and some of them we don't. Um, somebody right behind me talking? Thanks. Um, so, yes, it's about the conspiracy theories. Are these skeptics? Sometimes, I mean, they're being skeptics when they say this is not the official narrative isn't correct. And we heard from a gentleman over here how that's a pretty good idea to be a skeptic sometimes. Um, but when we take a look at conspiracies, I sort of hark back to the original conspiracy, which is religion. God did it. Um, we, it's an idea that we don't know what the answer is, and that's where the conspiracists live. And they try to throw a lot of skepticism on that situation and say, well, we don't know exactly what happened, so therefore we're going to go with this alternative explanation. Um, and whenever I hear someone asking, like, how do we debunk these things, do you ever sort of invoke Occam's razor, where you say, well, maybe the most simple explanation is that explanation, as opposed to these very convoluted things that require a lot of moving parts. Um, and so, again, I would guess, um, what would you add to your tool belt for all of us to listen to when we sort of encounter these uh, skeptics of reality? Well, I, I, Occam's razor, definitely. I mean, it, but when you get into something like 9-11, Occam's razor is kind of, it's difficult to find Occam's razor because even the official story has a lot of moving parts. And so it's, it, it's sometimes it's difficult to tell, but I, I think one of the things that we can focus on is I usually host like a Zoom meeting for my Twitter friends on Sundays and doing that gives me like this knowledge of how difficult conspiracies are to actually, you know, cause because we have a conspiracy to all meet at a certain time on a certain day. Not everybody makes it. Some people come late. Some people come early. So I, I think kind of using just like a real life example can also be helpful like okay you believe 9-11 was an inside job so here's your tool I want you to try and you know come up with a meeting and we're all going to do this meeting and we're all going to and then you might actually see how difficult it is um, and there's a game coming out called conspiracy and I wrote an article about it um, if you go to my tiny url uh, my AIPT link, I wrote an article about this game and the purpose of the game is to show how difficult it would be to actually carry out a conspiracy. So I, I think just even office stuff can kind of help people see how Occam's razor is really the best answer. All righty, we've got another uh, question or comment for you. And real quick before we get to it, uh, Stephanie, I just want to let you know that um, we we went ahead and did like a little uh, count of our of our attendance here. And what what'd you say? We're pushing sixty. Just 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 about just about what'd you say? Almost seventy people are in attendance today, which is dang near a record for our group here. So thank you. Um, yeah, we are truly appreciative of your time and your insight and your efforts and the frankly the passion that you bring to this topic. So. Thank you so much again, but uh, let's get on with our, our questions and comments here. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm going to be just going to the party because I've studied this subject for hundreds, hundreds of hours. I've been in presentations where there's a half a dozen brainiacs up on stage who have studied this subject for thousands, thousands of hours. They're usually scientists of all kinds, military officers, police officers, demolition experts, architects, engineers. Many of these people have lost their jobs, their careers, their positions, their marriages, 
because they had the guts to stand up and say, hold on here. Let's take a real look at what happened on 9-11. And Stephanie, I'm a little disappointed. You didn't even define what you thought a conspiracy was. Finally, in the mid-70s, the U.S. Senate reopened the investigation of the Kennedy assassination. I think it was called the church hearings. Frank Church was a senator from Oklahoma, probably the last Democrat. I think that was MK Ultra. Wasn't that the the church? I, I, I thought the church hearings were MK Ultra. It was, it was one of I, those. I, I'm not sure, but, the, but then maybe it wasn't Frank Church. The Senate re reopened the investigation of Kennedy's assassination in the mid 70s. They concluded that although they could not name the actual conspirators or the exact nature of the conspiracy, it was a conspiracy. And the Warren Commission's conclusion that some magic bullet did its thing, and that's why Kennedy died, was total balderdash. So I'm hoping that sometime in the future, I'll be able to arrange to bring in some real experts on the subject so we get a, uh, another side of the coin, another side of the argument. And uh, thank you, Stephanie, for your time and information. And I, I would suggest um, my uh, resident uh, JFK expert, Poker and Politics. He's on Twitter. He has a huge following. He's a great guy. Um, he, he once said to me in a text message, I can't even stop and get a drink at a gas station without talking about the Kennedy assassination. <laughs> so, um, Kennedy is to him what 9-11 is to me. So I, I would encourage, um, he's a great guy. He's really nice. Um, Arizona right wing watch knows him too. Um, at anything he he has he'd be great person to talk to i just noticed that your instagram handle is the derp state that is uh that's a that's a that's an interesting handle i like it all right we have another um uh question and comment right back here so uh thank you so much for your presentation stephanie um comment and question um my partner lived in new jersey and his mother was a engineer that worked on uh, the way he described it was updating buildings that needed um, construction updates and he remembers the day the towers fell he couldn't remember if his mother was working at grand central station or at the twin towers that day because she's supposed to work on one of those that day and he was freaking out because he couldn't contact his mother and um luckily she wasn't at either she was apparently at a third location but she am i oh well then i'll move i'll move slightly to the left then uh there maybe i'm in the right location now so she uh he remembers talking to her and she said because she had some background in construction she said um yeah it was completely reasonable that a plane hitting those buildings would have done the right amount of damage to cause them to fall she was aware of how they were structured and she knew that yeah if you hit if you hit a plane at the right place in the right time at the right speed yeah those towers were going to fall so yeah so she uh, provided a bit of like a sense to what was going on for him because he was a confused 12 year old. Um, so there's that. Um, she, uh, another, the, my question is, I don't think it really hit me. I think like I was generally aware of like the harm that is done to like conspiracy theorists themselves, but then to people around them when uh, conspiracy theories become popular and mainstream. But I think it really hit me today, like the harm that is done to other people when a conspiracy theory becomes 
lucrative mainstream. So I'm wondering what is your take on, you know, if a person who has a conspiracy theory, you know, brings it up, would it be helpful to ask them, well, yes, who benefits if you're right, but who's harmed when you're wrong? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that one, one of the things I tell people is to take the, um, there's this thing called the guide to red pilling, take that and kind of turn it on its head and take the, the main core tenets and principles of pilling as they call it, which is, you know, encouraging doubt in people. And that, that's why we chose the name doubt because doubt is the way out. When you start to doubt the things you've been told, that's when you either fall into a conspiracy theory or you fall out of it and encourage that and, and take some of the things like that's what they want you to think. And K Bono, take that and kind of push back against the conspiracy theories with it. And I, I, I think that that can be a useful tool. All right. We have a, a, an online comment here. And I think. I... And yes, actually, also another question just came in. So I'll admit, first of all, two of our online attendees mentioned Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the best one. And certainly when I watched Loose Change on Netflix and started to wonder about a building being demolished and stuff, then I thought, how many people would have to be in on it nationwide? It, that's too complicated. So gave up on that one. But we do have an online question from Hammer saying, um, what's asking, Stephanie, what started your journey out? Was there a specific event or moment that, caused you to begin rethinking some of your conspiracy beliefs? It, it's two, there's two parts to it. The, the first part is I remember for a while um, because I was always listening to these YouTube videos and I would always like put in 9-11 conspiracy theory. And that's, that would be my search. I kept hearing this little voice in the back of my head that said, type in debunked. And I kept ignoring that voice, but the fact that that voice was there, I think played a role in the second part, the part that really got me out. I had two friends and their son visiting me from Pennsylvania shortly after I moved to California. I made a comment. I'm not so sure about that Sandy Hook thing. I think they might've faked that. And my friend looked me right in the eye and said stuff. I have a coworker who lost a child there. And I thought to myself, split second, you know, but it felt like an eternity. This is someone I've known like 20 years. Um, this is someone I trust. This is someone who came to visit my mom when she was dying in the hospital, driving an hour and a half each way. This was someone who came to her funeral who did so much for me and I thought this person has no reason to lie and so I think that that little voice of doubt that had been in my head before I think that helped me to come out because I had two options look this friend straight in the eye and say you're full of shit or realize the enormity that I love this person I trust this person and that's what I did. And I, I think, I, you know, I told this person, don't ever tell me the name of the parent because that's not important. And I think I figured it out. And I, I told them, I think this was the parent, but don't confirm because I want that mystery to be there. And and to me, the in that moment, and and still to this day, it's not the name of the parent, but it's the fact that somewhere out there, there's someone that you know who's connected to a tragedy. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that response. And uh, just a reminder to the people on Zoom, um, if uh, it might, might be a good idea to turn your, your cameras off because you are on our big projection screen in here. So anyway, might not be on the recording, but anyways. All right. So we have a comment. Are we going to? All right. We're going to come right here first and then... 
let me just quickly say, um, I, I respect what you said, Patrick, uh, and I'm sure you don't believe that the, the, the people didn't die. I'm sure you believe that the people falling were just CGI, right? Okay, well, well, the point is, I think it's important before we dive into the rabbit hole to acknowledge what actually happened, how it happened, why it happened, who made it happen. That can be a, a, a subject for, for vast discussion, but, but the victims were the victims. I, I think I want to be clear about that. That's on the... Um, okay, okay. Can we? All right, that's let's good. let's stay on topic here. Thank you, um, Tina. Oh, we're Jesus. Go ahead, Tina. All right. Uh, first of all, yeah, I I was exposed to a lot of the uh 9 11 conspiracy stuff too, and quite a few other things. Um, you know, right after I got out of the army, actually, and I started being exposed to sovereign citizen state citizenship uh the you know biochip that was going to be put in our arms mark of the beast uh you know all kinds of different things you know i went to preparedness expo i mean my excuse is i was suffering from ptsd and probably still am so you know that certainly can affect one some i've just gotten out of you know gulf war and everything so uh i had no idea that people were actually saying that no one died at 9 11 that, yeah that was that was a new one that was a new one to me i that's that's um that's that was pretty wild um i i at, at the moon landing i remember people talking about you know i've i've, I've had people, people did debates about that you know and anyway i'm sorry i don't have a question i i just i can i can relate and i also know i mean with the moon landing being faked I have an, I have somewhat of an engineering background, and I know that for it to be faked, that would be more amazing than actually landing on the damn thing. Okay. Well, I mean, Stanley Kubrick directed it, so it would have been amazing either way. <laughs> he, he is a very gifted and talented director. We got time for one more here, and we're going to come to, and then we're going to have to close up shop here. So, um, well, twenty years ago, um, you know they. The Bush administration had this thing about um, weapons of mass destruction, which was two years after 9-11. Do you have research about how the ebb and flow of conspiracy theories based on the fact that it turned out there were no weapons of mass destruction? Well, they they did use it as an opportunity. I, I, I believe um, one of the books, I think it's the 102 Minutes book, they're talking about Shortly after it happened, and they were, you know, wargaming what was going on. They were like, "Well, how can we tie this to, you know, Iraq and and all that?" And so it it was, um, yeah. There there are conspiracies within the actual truth, and the WMD, like, you know, George Bush came out and said you know, we will not tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories about the people who did this. And okay, Georgie, but then why did you lie about the WMDs? Because you just make yourself look bad and you're just giving them fuel. And yeah, you know, I'm, and, that, and that's the thing where you have to find the line between the conspiracy theory and the conspiracy. Some people think, you know, people like me, they'll say stuff like, well, what about MK Ultra? Well, yeah, that was real. That happened. That happened. And so it, it's, you know, there is some shady stuff that definitely did go on with 9-11 and the weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, that was a big stinky one. And they shouldn't have never done that. <laughs> never. Uh -huh. Uh, Stephanie, um, before I get to the, the last comment, I just want to say it's been really wonderful having you um, join us today. And I, I certainly hope this isn't the last we see of you. I hope that you'll uh, you'll come be, be part of our day again. And maybe if you get an opportunity to come out in person and and meet some of these folks and try some of our delicious breakfast. It is so wonderful every time 
uh, every, every time we get a chance to it to come together like this. But uh, the last thing I'll ask is um, to close us out is uh, you, you did get into this a little bit, but I'm just going to give you a chance to reiterate for everybody watching here, uh, everybody joining us here and those who are watching online later. Um, so folks who uh, want to be a part of moving our, our discourse in the right direction, people who want to be a part of the solution, uh, and you know it's 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 a tall ask to ask somebody to stand up against the apparatus that that forms and um, disseminates these conspiracy theories. What can regular everyday people like us do to try to affect positive change and uh, start moving us in the direction where people employ better critical thinking and and don't fall victim to this this uh, divisive uh, these, these divisive points? I think it's it's always important to, you know when when you hear about something, in the news, I, I always try to do like a, a double source, you know, two, two big mainstream, you know, if I see something on some, like, like something had just recently come out about some guy who had funded Sound of Freedom being arrested for kidnapping a child. I saw this on a suspicious website. And the first sentence of the article was professional groomer like that's not how articles start out. Um, always look for at least two or three good sources with the news. And also it's important that when event an event first happens and you can go back and, and I've watched this like a hundred times on YouTube. I forget what the name, I think it was 9-11 as it happened. And it's 102 minutes of actual footage from that day as it as the events unfolded. Nobody knows what's going on when an event first happens. And so it's important to keep that in mind when the next mass shooting happens as it inevitably will. That information needs to be taken with a grain of salt, even if you do have two or three good sources, because the information is consistently unfolding. And you know sometimes you don't have the complete story sometimes till 10 years later, you know, and so be careful when events are unfolding, especially traumatic events, and also try to, you might have to wait a few days to get more information and reliable sources, but always look for at least three or four sources of, of something dependable before you kind of accept it, really. All right. Thank you again, Stephanie. It's been such a pleasure having you out here. And I hope that uh, you'll you'll come join us again. We'd love to continue this conversation and others just like it. It's been really productive and we've had a really good discussion and a, an amazing turnout. You know what? Give it up for all you guys. Let's hear for for, the, for this room full of people here at HSGP today. All right. 